And as we close out uh, Tuesday, April 20th of World Creativity Week and Innovation, Real Creativity and Innovation Week, we are very excited to be able to bring up Seven Steps to Genius Every Day by Malcolm Gelb. And for those who don't know, he has actually studied the life of Leonardo da Vinci. And to give you more sense about what he's going to be talking about today, drawing on da Vinci's notebooks, inventions, and legendary works of art, acclaimed author Michael Gelb introduces seven da Vinci principles for thinking like history's greatest genius. And so without further ado, I'm actually going to show you a video of Michael to give you a sense of what he's up to, what he's going to talk to us today, and we'll go from there. And here we go. As I get things going here. Leonardo da Vinci is one of humanity's greatest champions for independent original thinking. Would you like to experience a renaissance, a rebirth of your own energy and imagination? What kind of life do you want? All right, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely pumped up to hear Michael's presentation. So without further ado, the real Michael is here to talk about the seven steps of genius. Michael Gelb, go ahead and take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Great to be with all of you. So yes, Leonardo da Vinci was my childhood hero, along with Superman. My grandmother, Rosa, was an Italian painter and she told me about Leonardo. And there was something about her description just captured my imagination. And of course, as I got older, I realized Superman was only a comic book character, but Leonardo da Vinci was real. And the more I learned about him, the more amazing he seemed to be. So ultimately I did go to the place where he was born. I literally walked his footsteps. I went to the place where he died. I traveled to the great museums of the world where I could contemplate his great works of art. I interviewed the great da Vinci scholars and I actually read Leonardo's notebooks over and over again. There are about 7,000 pages that exist. It's estimated to be only half of what he originally noted, but some of them have been lost in the hundreds of years since he wrote them down. From that intense exploration, I, I really started to dream. I started to dream about Leonardo, but my dreams and my exploration were organized around one essential question. And the question is, what is he trying to teach us? What is his message for us today? For those of us who are interested in accessing and expressing our creativity for those of us who want to live more beautiful, fulfilling lives, to access our own potential. And the wonderful, wonderful discovery I made was that Leonardo gives specific practical advice 
He's giving it to his students at the time. So what I did was abstract that advice from his notebooks. And then I effectively translated it into contemporary terms so that we can actually apply it. And this took the form of the seven principles for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci, how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, seven steps to genius every day. That's the title of the book that I released in 1998. And you know, one of the really cool things that's happened since then is the emergence of the new paradigm of neuroplasticity. It used to be believed that your intelligence, your creative potential was pretty much fixed at age seven and that it wouldn't get any better after that. And we also <laughs> used to believe, and this was the accepted understanding of neuroscience, that once you reached age, age 30, you began a slow, steady process of decline. <laughs> well, I can afford to laugh because those old ideas have been overturned since the book came out. So in other words, neuroscience has only added to the support of the power of the seven da Vinci principles. Neuroplasticity, the idea that your brain is designed, neuro means brain cell, you've got 100 billion of them. Plasticity means changeable, adaptable, flexible. So in other words, your brain is designed to improve with use. And the only question is, what's the best way to use it? And it turns out it's thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. He gives us the actual advice in his notebooks. The other new word that neuroscientists came up with, and you know, neuroscientists are not the kind of people who just casually throw out a new word. There has to be strong evidence. And the other word is neuroneogenesis. In other words, we can actually create new brain cells. Once again, it depends on how we use this amazing inheritance, this birthright. I say we have a birthright of da Vinci and genius, but the amazing brain didn't come with a manual, which is why I want to bring you these seven da Vinci principles now so you can get started on accessing your own da Vincian powers. So I'm going to share my screen and take you through the principles. So let's dive right in. See if I can get this to move along. Here we go. There we go. So there you see an image of Leonardo's notebooks. Bill Gates paid $30.8 million for 72 pages of Leonardo's notebooks in 1994. That's one genius's tribute to the greatest genius who ever lived. And the first principle for thinking like Leonardo is truly our birthright of genius. In Italian, it is curiosità, curiosità. Say it in your best Italian accent, curiosità. You see da Vinci's curiosity expressed in these notebooks where he writes down questions like, what is the cause of wind? Why is the sky blue? How does a bird fly? Are these, these are the kind of questions that most children ask naturally. But Leonardo applies this genius focus to actually providing amazing answers that were so far ahead of their time. You know, in his anatomical notebooks, he recorded minutia of the the way blood flows around and through the heart. The first of all, still used in medical schools today. There was a recent big flourish of things on social media about a Leonardo discovery. This is from 550 years ago that they just realized was 
the most accurate depiction description of the functioning of the human heart. We're still learning from him. Science is still learning from history's greatest genius centuries later. So curiosita, this is your birthright. So let's get right into it. how do you actually think like Leonardo? What does he tell you to do? And what he tells you to do is to do exactly what he does. And that's to keep a notebook. So if I ask you, where are you physically located when you get your best ideas? Where are you actually physically located? The number one answer around the world is in the shower <laughs> or the bath. People also say they get their best ideas resting in bed, driving their car, walking in nature, meditating, yoga class, Tai Chi class. Almost no one gets their best idea at school or at work. <laughs> What's happening in the shower or in nature that doesn't happen at school or at work? What happens is, first of all, you usually by yourself, so you're not afraid of embarrassment if you come up with a really wacky idea. And these are all activities where people relax and our brain waves slow down from the active beta state when we're engaging with other people at school or at work into the slower alpha or theta state more associated with an aha. So what Leonardo tells us specifically is have a little notebook, carry it with you wherever you go. And when you get an idea, you wake up at four o'clock in the morning with a crazy idea, write that crazy idea down in your notebook. Now, when I went to school, my teacher always told me, stop doodling. But Leonardo says, doodle in your notebook. <laughs> and by the way, another one of the greatest geniuses of all time, maybe the greatest genius of practical business innovation, Thomas Edison, 1,093 United States patents. Edison gave the exact same advice to the people who worked in his laboratory. So it's a simple, practical way to start nurturing your curiosita. Keep a little notebook. And when you start recording your ideas, see, here's what happens. Average person wakes up at four o'clock in the morning. They have a creative idea, but they think, oh, I'm no genius. So they go back to sleep. But Leonardo da Vinci, Marie Curie, Thomas Edison, great geniuses throughout history, they write it down. So first practical thing you can do is carry a little notebook and doodle in it creatively, bring it with you wherever you go. So this is Leonardo's drawing of the embryo in the womb. You can see just how curious he was. He really wanted to know the secret of life, the beginning of life. And he gives us the first accurate drawing of the embryo in the womb. And I love this because it, it represents this idea of our unlimited potential. And here's my favorite da Vinci invention. Leonardo da Vinci invented the parachute before anybody could fly. That is thinking ahead. These are three views of a flower. Each one is exquisite. And they represent the second principle for thinking like Leonardo. Dimostrazione. Say it in your best Italian accent and make an expressive gesture. Dimostrazione. What does it mean? Demonstration. Demonstrate things in your own experience. Become, as Leonardo urges his students, an inventor an original thinker. You see, at the time of Leonardo, the challenge to original thinking, besides the strictures of the church authorities of the time, was just the lack of access to information. Books were rare. If you found one, it would be in Latin, which you would not have learned unless you came from a noble or very wealthy family. Leonardo da Vinci taught himself Latin when he was 40 years old, so he could read the classics as they became available. What's the impediment 
to independent thinking today. Too much information. How do you cut through the tsunami of spam and become an inventore? The way you do it is you practice dimostrazione. You practice looking at things from an independent perspective. And Leonardo says, in order to do that, look at any important issue from at least three angles. That's why he shows us the three views of the flower. When he did a dissection, he did the dissection from three angles of entry into the body. When he sketches a face for a painting, he does it from three different perspectives. He writes to his students, to us, he says, he didn't have this word, he didn't, he didn't have the phrase confirmation bias, but it basically means we're prejudiced to believe what we think is probably so, our first notion or idea. So he, he tells us to question our beliefs, especially our limiting beliefs, like the most notorious limiting belief, which is that I'm not creative. <laughs> I hear that from people all the time. <laughs> no, you just haven't developed it yet. I have other people who say I'm wildly creative, but I can't be organized. We can help them too. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So dimostrazione, become an independent thinker, look at things, important issues from three different angles or perspectives. This is a painting by Leonardo's teacher, The Baptism of Christ by Verrocchio. And Verrocchio asked his promising apprentice, the young Leonardo, to do the angel in the corner. So Leonardo did this beautiful angel with the flowing blonde curls. And according to Vasari, the first art historian, when Verrocchio came back and saw how exquisite Leonardo's angel was, he would never touch colors again. Now, the romantic interpretation of that has always been that Verrocchio was so moved by his student's genius that he just couldn't paint. But the more realistic business interpretation is that Verrocchio said, aha, I can now delegate the painting department to the young Leonardo so I can concentrate on the more profitable practice of sculpture. But if you look at these two angels, they, they give you the secret of the third principle, which is sensazione. Say it again, best Italian accent, big gesture, sensazione. Of course, it means to sharpen the senses, awaken the senses, awaken your appreciation of beauty in everyday life. So if you look at Verrocchio's angel, Verrocchio's angel looks like a bored choir boy. Okay, baptism of Christ, whatever, yada, 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 fill out all the paperwork. <laughs> Leonardo's angel looks like, wow, this is a miracle, which is actually the subject of the painting. And it was another genius, Einstein, who said there are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. So how do we, how do we translate Leonardo's advice to look for beauty in everyday life. Leonardo knew that when you are exposed to the beauty of nature, the beauty of great works of art, of beautiful music, even the feel of fine fabrics, beautiful scents, the, the, the beauty and the scent of a gorgeous flower, the amazing blue sky, the sensual beauty of the feeling of wind gently against your face, or the taste of chocolate or the smell of chocolate. Well, you just, if you just imagine that smell and then you imagine that taste, you're probably salivating just like I am. <laughs> so our imagination is so powerful. And Leonardo said, the more we surround ourselves with actual beauty, the more we feed the soul, we inspire the imagination. So a simple question, every day, use your curiosità to empower your sensazione and ask this magic question. How can I make my life more beautiful today? How can I make life more beautiful for others today? And when you 
jot in your notebook your thoughts about that question and then bring them into reality. Sometimes it's the simplest, as simple as just smile. Find something lovely and nice to say to somebody. It's amazing the power we all have to help somebody else have a more beautiful day. And the more we do that, the more beautiful our day is and the more creative we become. So, oh, we're going backwards. There we go. The fourth principle for thinking like Leonardo, we're gonna make this gesture. This is Leonardo St. John, it's in the Louvre in France, in Paris. So take your left hand, put it on your heart. Take your right hand, point up to heaven across your body. Then tilt your head and make that mysterious smile. And the fourth principle is sfumato. Say it aloud. Sfumato, sfumato, molto bene. Sfumato is the term that art critics coined to refer to the hazy, mysterious quality in Leonardo's paintings. A quality that he was able to create by using hundreds of gossamer thin layers of paint so that the light seems to suffuse magically from behind the canvas. And what it represents is perhaps the most distinguishing characteristic of highly created people, which is our ability to embrace the unknown, to smile in the face of uncertainty. See, St. John says, awaken your emotional intelligence, open your heart, have a higher purpose, and keep your sense of humor. <laughs> of course, we see these same themes in the most famous painting in human history, the Mona Lisa. What is she smiling about? Ha <laughs> ha, let's find out. Everybody, wherever you are, assume the Mona position and imitate her famous smile. How does it make you feel when you smile like Mona Lisa? Well, I did this exercise with a group of gifted children in Rappahannock County, Virginia. 80 gifted children, ages eight to 11. And I love the, the, the gifted children because they were so earnest and serious. They really got into imitating Mona. And one of them said, she's got a secret. And another one of the children said, yeah, she knows that everything has an opposite. And then the kids started shouting out opposites like day and night, good and bad, light and dark, boys and girls, life and death. I did the same exercise a while ago with a business group and somebody said, I read in the Wall Street Journal that the famous smile was caused by a dental problem. <laughs> See, Mona Lisa is the Western equivalent of the ancient knowledge of yin and yang. The secret of life and of creativity is the harmony of the opposites. And this is the fifth principle for thinking like Leonardo. Arte Scienza. Say it in your best Italian accent, make a gesture. Arte Scienza. Balance art and science, logic and imagination, reason and intuition. This is part of why we think of Leonardo as the greatest genius who ever lived because he created the most famous painting in human history and a few other of the most famous paintings in human history. He invented the parachute before anybody could fly. He was a pioneer in anatomy, botany, geology, physics. He was a genius of both art, science, and invention. And he gives advice on, on how do we access this ability to shift between these two modalities. Some people overly detailed, logical, step-by-step, -step, analytical. They want, they want to develop their ability to generate, to be imaginative, to be more exploratory. 
other folks, very exploratory, imaginative, playful, have some trouble getting organized. <laughs> My mission is to help everyone think like Leonardo and balance art and science, balance logic and imagination. And I'm gonna share with you a simple, elegant, powerful method that can help you do that every single day. But first, the sixth principle, corporalita, corporalita, balance the body and the mind. So everyone knows this famous Leonardo da Vinci drawing, it's called the Vitruvian man, named after Vitruvius, the Roman architect who thought that the human body expressed the perfect proportions for building harmonious buildings. It's also known as the canon of proportion, and it's used more than 500 years after it was drawn by Leonardo as a global symbol of health, wholeness, wellness. I saw it just the other day as the logo of a yoga studio, and somebody sent me some kind of vitamin and it had this on the cover. <laughs> it's on the one euro coin. So you know, this, this is part of how we know when art is truly universal because it's timeless and it's global. It's all over the world. This, this symbol is instantly recognizable. And it, what it represents is our sixth principle, corporalita, corporalita, balance the body and the mind because genius takes energy. And Leonardo gives advice on how we can all eat in a way that's healthy and nutritious and enjoyable. He says, get moderate exercise. He was renowned as the strongest man in Florence. He was so graceful and poised in his movement that people would come out and just watch him walk down the street because he just had such a natural ease and elegance in his movement. And he tells us, he lets us know that we should preserve our own health. Those are his actual, he says, learn to preserve your own health. Today, we call that holistic health. He says, avoid grievous moods and keep your mind cheerful. Well, today we call that psychoneuroimmunology. In other words, we know that your attitude affects your immune system moment to moment. So this is the Adoration of the Magi. It's in the Uffizi Gallery. You see the central figure, the holy figure is serene. And as you get away from the center, there's lots of emotion and drama. And then here's one of the other most famous paintings in human history, The Last Supper, same theme. There's the holy figure in the center, serene. The disciples are reacting to a major announcement that has just been made with intensity of emotion, because this is the Renaissance where now these figures are portrayed not in two-dimensional, flat, with a halo, but rather as humans who are at this dinner, the Last Supper, and they just heard Christ say, one of you shall betray me. And they're saying, oh my God, who could it have been? Oh, wow. So Leonardo's a genius. He captures the moment of highest tension. It's the most dramatic moment. It draws us into the space. And yet we notice that the central figure is serene. So part of what Leonardo is telling us is connect your life to a higher purpose, something that serves humanity, that serves the planet, that serves others. And you'll always find serenity, even in the face of grave change and apparent chaos. So this is the seventh principle for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. Connezione, connezione. Everything connects to everything else. 
everything connects to everything else. So here are my notes <laughs> for this talk. Of course, it's a mind map. Mind mapping originated by my old friend, Tony Buzan, is a simple, easy, fun way to generate and organize and remember our ideas. You see my central image for my mind map is Leonardo's parachute. Beneath it is the Vitruvian person representing our human potential. And then you see branches with the keywords printed and a little illustration for each of the keywords makes it really easy to remember. Tony used to love to say that he was inspired to create mind mapping by his study of the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci and Thomas Edison. So could this have been my notes for this talk? Yeah, they are. If you copy these notes, could you use it to share the principles pretty fluidly and easily with someone else? Yes, you could. So mind mapping is a simple, powerful, elegant way to think like Leonardo, to integrate arte scienza, to awaken your curiosità, to smile in the face of uncertainty and to make connections that you might not have made otherwise. I've used mind mapping to write all 17 of the books I've written so far and I'm using it to write the next one. <laughs> so you can use it to remember everything you have to remember for a test in school or a presentation you have to give at work or a strategic plan or a plan for your own life or for your summer vacation. It's incredibly versatile. And the more you mind map, see, the more you make your mind map, that I'm just looking around because I have mind maps here everywhere in my office. Here's my to-do mind map for today's uh, plans for the day. There's a big mind map on my board over there for a huge project I'm working on. And there's one over there that I use when I'm doing coaching for my various clients all over the world. So simple, elegant, powerful, and it's also based on the way your brain, your mind wants to work. So we, we actually have a free three hour mind mapping seminar when people go to our Genius Mastery site you can click you get one of these pop-up things and you click on it you just put in your email and we'll send you this three-hour mind mapping seminar which is really cool and it's completely free so i would just love you to learn this that's why i put it up there free whether you 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 engage with our whole video seminar i want you to have a free mind mapping seminar because it's just so cool and it utterly changed my life and the lives of tens of thousands of people, actually hundreds, probably millions of people around the world. So this is an overview of the principles of how to think like Leonardo da Vinci. And I'd love to take some questions if we have some. So I will stop sharing my sc screen and see if we have some questione. Michael, bravo, bravo. Thank you very much for that incredible presentation. I was definitely writing down notes like crazy. I have a full page full and it's, it's very inspiring to hear Leonardo's story. And for those tuning in, now's your chance to definitely write in some questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A section, whatever is easier for you. We'd love for you to ask Michael some questions about his life, about Leonardo's life and make sure you're optimized for what you need. One of the things I like, uh, Michael, is the, the good sense of humor you have. And I, I loved uh, how you brought up that Leonardo had a great sense of humor. Do you have any favorite funny stories you like to talk about that Leonardo took part in or created with his sense of humor? Well, the funny, the really funny things with Leonardo are the huge mistakes he made. And it's really, it's wonderful to share these with people because we think, oh my God, the greatest genius of all time. That means I have to be perfect and I'll never be like that. This is the biggest 
limiting belief people have is, well, I'm not Leonardo or Edison or Marie Curie. No, you're, you are you. It's true, you're not them, but you can use their example to express more of who you are, which is how the process of our unique individual creative discovery works. But it helps to know that, for example, there's a famous story of how Leonardo, when he was employed by the Duke of Milan, where he, he spent 17 years in Milan doing everything for the Duke from painting the Last Supper to helping prepare for the entertainments that the Duke would put on for his dignitaries and guests and also making all sorts of inventions. But Leonardo also was a chef. And for a very important banquet, the, the Duke asked Leonardo to prepare an unparalleled dinner for these dignitaries. So Leonardo brought in his artist friends and he came up with the, the idea that became very popular in the 1980s uh, in French, it's called the uh, cuisine minceur. It's little sculpted, delicate, elegant portions of food. And you, you still see these today at very, very fancy restaurants, like one little bite. So Leonardo had his artist friends and he built a conveyor belt so that they could each work on each dish and, and send it out to the kitchen. And they, he set it all up so they would all know which ingredient make everything perfect. But because this was a huge kitchen and all these dishes were coming out at the same time, he also built a sprinkler system in case of fire. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> there were too many people in the kitchen. It was chaotic. A fire started. And yes, the sprinkler system worked and flooded everything. And all the food went whooshing out in a giant mess into the dining room where all the dignitaries were going to be having the dinner. So he's the greatest genius of all time. But great geniuses make great faux pas. And then they laugh at themselves. They learn from that and they move on to the next adventure. So it's very, it's helpful. And you see this, you see this in the art, you see the, you know, this, the smile that Leonardo's having fun with us and he wants us to have fun. And the more serious, whatever you're doing, the more serious it is, the more important it is to be able to smile like Mona Lisa. I love that. I love that. The, the fact that he put a buffer in place because he kind of knew what might happen. <laughs> so That's awesome. And I also uh, read somewhere, maybe you can verify if this is true or, so, or, or not, that I heard that he was on his deathbed and he was telling people like his biggest regret in life was not scratching the surface of his potential. Do you know anything about that? Well, yeah, well, it was it, the deathbed story is is somewhat uh, likely to be apocryphal. Hmm. Uh, the, the story is that he was attended to by Francois I, the King of France, who was his patron. So what we do know is that Leonardo spent the last three, year of his life, three years of his life in France, in the Loire Valley. I went to that palace. I went to Leonardo's, it's called the Clos de Luce, right next to Francois I's big palace. But Leonardo's mini palace was pretty spectacular. And you can be in his, uh, bedroom at where I was looking out his window at the view of his patron's palace and the little church down the way. So I, when I say I looked at the world from Leonardo's point of view, I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. What we do know is that Leonardo does write in his notebook from time to time, there are these notes where he says, did I really ever accomplish anything? This, because he's what he realized. He, see, he wanted to know all knowledge. He wanted to know the mind of God. He wanted to know the secret of birth and death. And that that's that's a pretty high aspiration. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so he realized as he as he got older that. As much as he had done, there was so much more to do. But that's where the seven principles come in because, see, how to think like Leonardo, what our, all this work is about, it's to carry on 
so that we all can apply the same kind of thinking and all help to make sense of this crazy world and all help to add more elements of truth and beauty and goodness into our understanding of this phenomenal universe. I love that. I love that. So, so we're not sure if the quote is necessarily true, but it, it's a good to know that you know, he did compare himself to literally needing to know everything to feel accomplished. That makes sense too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But don't feel so bad. <laughs> yeah, well, makes sense. Let's see here. So a, a great question came from the audience. They said, where should a novice start with tapping into their genius? Start by keeping a notebook. Start by keeping a notebook. It's, you know, it's not just Leonardo. It's not just Edison. It's every great genius who ever lived. And it's the simplest thing in the world because there are no wrong answers in your, in your notebook. And then obviously I invite people to work their way through the practical exercises in the book. And if you really want to think like Leonardo, we've created this phenomenal 38 video lessons, 23 practical explorations. It's the, it's the course that I have been teaching just for the last 40 plus years around the world, except you can do it at home, you can do it on your device, you can do it on your, on your TV. So Genius Mastery are the sponsors of this but it's it's a guided journey through the mind of Leonardo in a really practical way. So that's that's the the book or the course are I think are the best places to start. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written them and created them. No, oh, makes sense. And, and speaking of that, uh, one person asked, "What is the biggest difference between reading the book and doing the online course?" Uh, it's like the difference between reading about Italy and going to Italy. <laughs> love that it's yeah. great to read about italy i love it i go oh my god but it makes me really want to go <laughs> makes sense love it oh this is a good question from brian uh, brian said what could leonardo teach our political leaders today <laughs> well thanks brian because funny thing is in 1982 I actually moved to Washington, D.C. I've been living in England for seven years. And I moved to Washington, D.C. because I wanted to teach our political leaders how to think like this. They weren't interested. <laughs> oh, man. But no, I'll tell you the good news. I'll tell you the good news is that educators have been interested and are interested. But surprisingly to me, business people were really interested. And the good news is that business in the US is 80% of our economy. And the US is, still remains the biggest economy in the world. That means government and, it, and nonprofits are only 20%. So I'm deeply involved in helping business leaders think like Leonardo da Vinci, because it's the business leaders who then will influence our political leaders to be more creative. I like that. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, luckily, yeah, we're, well, luckily we're not, like, we're in a capitalist society, so the, the one definitely can influence the other, so I, I agree with about that. And moving on to a different topic here, one person says, as a parent, what advice can you give me to help my elementary age child who is not quite ready to keep a notebook? Yes. So I get this question a lot, and it's one I'm really, really passionate about because people over the years, the book's been out for 23 years, people keep saying, when are you gonna write how to think like Leonardo da Vinci for, for parents and kids? And I've been tempted, but the real answer is parent, apply this yourself. And then you have nothing, then you have, the job is done. You apply the exercise, you model it, be it be it because children learn by imitation they don't they don't follow necessarily every parent does they don't necessarily follow what you say they look at what you do they look at who you are if they see that you're curious if you're asking them lots of questions follow not just what did you do at school today or what did you do on zoom school today <laughs> but well tell me more about what you learned and how did you feel about that and what surprised you the most 
today? And what would you really like to be learning? So, because you know how kids do that to grownups when they're really young, they don't stop asking. So if you, the parent, are just as curious, then you're waking up and inviting their demonstrazione. You're, you say, well, let's look at this from another point of view and what might another perspective be? And then you're, you're teaching them to think like uh, Leonardo and to apply demonstrazione without ever using the term. If you create a beautiful environment in your home, if you are, you know, this is really important for, this is probably the most important one for parents is you've got to teach your children how to be curators of their own souls because the, the power of social media, what's, what lurks in their phone, on their device, on their screen, is the worst of everything that humanity has ever generated and the best, all available for free. <laughs> but all of the worst is highly addictive and all of the best requires some intentional focus. So you must be a fierce guardian of that gateway. And the only way you have any credibility in doing that is if you're doing it yourself. So again, it all comes back to the parent modeling this and, and then I'm not worried about your children. Can you speak more to uh, speaking of like family and, and, and taking care of family? Can you go over more of uh, Leonardo's financial journey? Like, what, was he born into wealth? Did he have to did he, did he become super wealthy? Like, oh, he had sure. all these things going on. How, what was that like for him? Yeah. Yeah. So his, his, his father, Piero, was a notary slash accountant. And so was his great grandfather. But Leonardo's father, Piero, was not married to his mother, Caterina. And children born out of wedlock couldn't qualify for membership in the Guild of Notary Accountants. But for this quirk of fate, Leonardo probably would have been the greatest accountant of all time. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny that he was born on April 15th, which is tax day in the United States. <laughs> That's funny, actually. <laughs> so, so his father, Sir Piero, was today we'd call probably middle class. And Leonardo couldn't go to the, the academic path because of his status. So Piero sent him to vocational school as an apprentice to Verrocchio. So he wasn't wealthy by any means, but his father, as his father saw that he had exceptional potential, he did attempt to encourage and create opportunities for his son, who originally, after graduating from Verrocchio studio, Leonardo started his own studio, and then was sponsored by the Medici. When he was about 30, he wrote the most famous employment application letter of all time to the Duke of Milan. It's, it's right at the beginning of how to think like Leonardo Da Vinci, the book, and it's also, we also go over it in the course because it's so compelling and amazing. Here's the greatest genius of all time and he needs a job. So he writes this amazing employment application letter. He gets the job. He works for the Duke of Milan for 17 years. Then the French invade. The Duke becomes a refugee. Leonardo becomes a refugee. He wanders around for a while till he finds his next patron, which for a while was the Vatican. The, the Pope, for a while it was Cesare Borgia of the famous Borgia family in the central Italian states. Then he had a second period in Florence and he went back to Milan for a while and then eventually was under the patronage of Francois I. So it's kind of like my business. I mean, I have to work for a living, but fortunately, various organizations around the world sponsor what I do so I can apply it to help their, their enterprises. But yeah, he always needed a patron or a sponsor. He had to work for a living and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, got to pay the bills. That makes I, sense, yes. <laughs> I love that. And we had another question. Uh, I was asked is what is the higher purpose that you tap into in your work when you 
get up out of bed each day and teach these teachings? Oh, well, for me, my higher purpose is clear. It's, it's to make a more beautiful world, a world that is more creative, more conscious, and more compassionate. And, and, also, and, and part of how I do that is I help other people discover their higher purpose. Leonardo said this, he said, it's actually, it, we teach this, it's in the book and it's in the course. We take you through a graduated series of exercises where you'll make a mind map about the purpose of your life, your values, your mission, and all your goals, and look at it all, all together. This is what I've been doing for years with, with companies, because every company has a vision, mission, values, and then they have to have goals and strategies. But what I really want to do is help humans do this for themselves. It's so powerful. It's so transformational. Leonardo said, fix your course to a star and you can navigate through any storm. And that star is your purpose. Love that. Love that. And once again, uh, for those who are listening in, we have a few minutes left. So if you do have any questions for Michael about him, about Leonardo, now's your chance to ask in either the chat box or the Q&A section. Love to hear from you. Otherwise, I can keep asking questions all day because I'm, I'm fascinated, fascinated by this. And I, of course, want to make sure that we can play Michael's video at the end. So make sure to do that. And while, while people are putting their questions together, um, because you're so passionate about helping people, what is one of your favorite stories about, uh, in, in the first session uh, last week, you talked about how she loved teaching people juggling. Uh, do you have any other favorite stories of uh, taking a, a person or a company from A to B using Leonardo's principles? Wow, wait, how many more hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> That's the right question. Yeah. So I, no, you know, what's really funny is that I just, I just got a letter. I just, uh, we just <clears throat> scanned it and sent it to someone because, I got uh, an inquiry from a potential client who, you know, the people have been through a, a, a pandemic, they've been working from home, they're starting to go back to the office, they've lost some of their sense of the culture of their organization, their team spirit, and their, the big, big boss of this company was basically told his HR person, people are not really thinking as creatively as we like they're not coming up they're not focused on our clients and coming up with new solutions and new ideas for those clients and it's a difficult time so he asked her to reach out to me to see if i could come in and and work with this this company and the cool thing is that this gentleman engaged me 25 years ago and I worked for eight years with the company he was part of then. His, one of his senior executives, I helped develop to become, take over as CEO of that company. One of the uh, vice presidents of that company went on to become an executive vice president of another company she engaged me for about six years to help her at that company. Then somebody who worked at that company went to another company, which I still work with. And now the original guy from 25 years ago wants me to help his, his people. So you know, my, my, my work with people is legacy. It's now, I've been doing this long enough. It's second generation, third generation, fourth generation from people. You know, one of, one of these clients, uh, I started working with them five years ago. I helped them to find their purpose right there, make a mind map. We got everybody in the company to make a mind map of the vision of the company and share all the mind maps. And they were so enthusiastic. And we put it into one mind map and then we put it on the website, except instead of a dry thing written by consultants, this has the mojo, the heart, the soul of all the people in this company. So this company is now, I think, two, three years in a row named best places to work in, in New Jersey, best place to work in New York. They've expanded to become national, Inc., uh, fastest growing companies in, in, in America. So 
yeah, this is what we do. I mean, this is what, how we live. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, I know that uh, you wanted to make sure we got a chance to play another video. So I'm going to go ahead and get that started. Any context that uh, people should be aware of before playing the video? I think if I, if this is a video, I think it is, I think it's just one of the videos we made to let people know a little bit more about our online experience. All right, let's go ahead and play the video and we'll go from there. Buongiorno. I'm Michael Gill, and I'm delighted to be your host for this course based on my book, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, Seven Steps to Genius Every Day. The course takes you through the mind of history's greatest genius and shows you how to apply his methods to enrich the quality of your life. You'll improve your memory, accelerate your learning ability, develop your critical and creative thinking strengthen your life energy and cultivate a sense of perspective and peace in the midst of uncertainty and chaos. There's no better time to invoke the genius of Leonardo da Vinci for your life and for our society. This is your invitation to be part of the new renaissance. It's time to wake up and think creatively. Leonardo left specific instructions on how his students can awaken their creative powers. The young Leonardo wrote, I wish to work miracles. I spent years decoding his miraculous teachings, and I am so happy to be able to share it with you. The more I learned about him, the more amazing he became to me. More than just the artist, who created the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, two of the greatest and most acclaimed works of art in human history, he was also a brilliant scientist and a prolific inventor. If you wanna live a more creative life and fulfill your human potential, there's no better role model than Leonardo. But is it really possible to think like Leonardo da Vinci? Yes! your brain is better than you think. And it's designed to improve with use. That's right. Unlike other body parts like knees and hips that do wear out, your brain actually gets better if you learn to use it properly. With appropriate training and practice, you can raise your IQ, improve your memory, and sharpen your intelligence. But your brain didn't come with a user's manual. Fortunately, Leonardo provides one for you now. Avanti. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, before we, well, well first, uh, if people want to get a hold of you and contact you with more questions about you, about Leonardo da Vinci, what's the best way to contact you? People can write to me at michael at michaelgeld.com. They can go to my website, michaelgeld.com. And if they want to learn more about our amazing video program, geniusmastery.com, geniusmastery.com. All right, I'll make sure to put those links in the chats and any final departing words or insights for the audience today? Smile like Mona Lisa. Ask every day, how can I make life more beautiful for myself? How can I make life more beautiful for everybody else? Grazie mille.